today's webinar. Thanks, Juan. Um, joining today's webinar in the Land Manager Leadership Series. I'm Kelsey Virgin. I'm a project manager with the Wall Center who's hosting this webinar today. Uh, in this series, we feature seasoned public land managers utilizing grazing as a management tool to share their successes, challenges, and everything in between to hopefully inspire and empower fellow land managers and stewards. Today, we are excited to have Lisa Kardash from Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources joining us. To start us off, I'm first going to go over some logistics for the webinar today. I'll talk briefly about the Wall Center and Pasture Project, then we'll get into our presentation and we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for your questions at the end. In terms of Zoom technology, um, we do ask that you keep yourselves muted during the presentation, but you should feel free to put questions you have in the chat box as you have them. We'll have time at the end of the presentation to address them, but feel free to put the questions in as you have them so you don't lose track. If you're having technical difficulties, also feel free to put those questions in the chat box and we'll do what we can to help you out. And of course, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Pasture Project YouTube channel in the coming week. All right, so a little bit about the Wallace Center. So Wallace Center works nationally to bring together diverse people and ideas to co-create solutions that build healthy farms, equitable economies, and resilient food systems. Our vision is that all communities have the power to nourish themselves and regenerate ecosystems through just food and agriculture systems. At the heart of these systems are dynamic networks of people connected through interdependent relationships with each other in the land. Pasture Project is an initiative of the Wall Center that works to advance and integrate regenerative grazing as a scalable market-driven solution for building healthy soil, viable farms, and resilient communities in the upper Midwest, and specifically in a six-state region in the upper Mississippi River Basin, although we do work with some national audiences. The Pasture Project provides farmers, grazers, land managers, and others with a data-backed case for the economic, environmental, and social benefits of implementing regenerative grazing. We continue to build a strong alliance of partners for supporting regenerative grazing and other regenerative management practices across the Upper Mississippi River Basin. Since 2014, we've been championing the use of conservation grazing on public land as a tool in the toolbox for managing public grasslands. So what is conservation grazing? Conservation grazing is a type of managed grazing, and it has the potential to mimic some of the positive impacts of historical native herbivores, such as deer, elk, and possibly bison on grassland ecosystems. Rotating livestock through paddocks via conservation grazing can create beneficial disturbance if done with the right seasonality, intensity, and extent, and followed by adequate periods of rest recovery for the soil and plant communities. Well-managed grazing on public, publicly managed grasslands has been shown to provide both environmental and economic benefits. Manure left behind by cattle improves soil health by supporting soil microorganisms as well as insects that can increase the food resources for games and birds. Grazing can increase the structural diversity of grassland plant communities, which benefits a host of organisms. Conservation grazing on public lands is a flexible tool that can be customized to meet a variety of objectives, including maintaining and improving habitat for wildlife species, specific plant communities, and recreational opportunities. Grazing on public lands can be a win-win for livestock and wildlife. If you'd like to learn more about our grazing work, you can visit pastureproject.org, or for more about our other initiatives at Wall Center, wallcenter.org. And um, I'd like to introduce our presenter today. So we are thrilled to have Lisa Kardash with us. Lisa is a native Wisconsinite and grew up in Verona, just outside of Madison. She received her Bachelor and Master's of Science in Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. For the past 17 years, Lisa has served as a wildlife biologist with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. During that time, she's been responsible for implementing wildlife management program in Portage and Wood counties. A significant portion of her work involves the management of 15,000 acres of grassland habitat on the Buena Vista and Paul J. Olson wildlife areas. Conservation grazing is one of the many management tools she uses on these properties. Lisa, her husband, and her four children live next to Buena Vista grasslands and spend as much time as they can outdoors together. They enjoy camping, hiking, hunting, fishing, biking, gardening, and simply exploring the natural world as a family. So thank you, Lisa, for joining us today and being willing to share your expertise and perspective. We really appreciate it. And I'm going to hand it off to you. Okay, let me know when you can see the screen and hopefully it's the right one. So it's show. I can see your screen, but it's showing us the um, 
the view so from earlier. Again, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness. And we'll how get did there. we fix that one before? The, under the display settings, there's yeah. a little drop down at the top. Right. There okay. And then Swap. the last one. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> okay. We got there. Great. Hold on here just a second. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, today, I, I plan on speaking, as um, Kelsey had mentioned here, on my experiences with conservation grazing and how I've cultivated my program here in central Wisconsin. Um, so just um, I, I'm, in this presentation, I'm going to be giving a brief background on my experiences with grazing as an early career professional, and then how this program has evolved when I first came here in Wisconsin to now, um, as far as grazing in central Wisconsin. And then I'd just like to dive into some of the, the details, the, the nitty gritty of the program that I have since um, developed and, and have helped getting um, assistance with, with other colleagues. So this is just showing where the two properties are that I focus most of my work. Um, the Buena Vista and the Paul J. Olson Wildlife Area is here in central Wisconsin. I've been, um, I was uh, starting here in 2006 and have since been the property manager for those two properties. I came into central Wisconsin with a fairly limited understanding of grazing as a habitat management tool. So, um, you know, even though the grazing itself had been occurring on the lands that I had managed for quite a long time, I did not have a lot of experience and um, had limited on the job training too when I started. It was mostly veteran staff that had some understanding of fencing, but not a real in-depth understanding of grazing as a management tool. Um, and really at that time, there wasn't a whole lot of formal training either. Um, just a school of hard knocks, going out there and putting up fence, taking it down. So the, the program that existed uh, before I came in, primarily it was continuous grazing. Now we weren't using rotational grazing at the time. And it, this had been a tool that had been used since the eighties on these properties. Um, a small group of local producers were the ones that were doing the grazing. It was typically the same handful of producers every single year. And although we did have land agreements, we did not have any formal grazing management plans um, with any of these pastures that we had when I first started. So getting into 2015, um, managed grazing you know, started coming more into the forefront and we were hearing about other agencies and partners utilizing it. And so a local wildlife technician, Erin Grossman, who you've heard from uh, last week during this seminar, she was the one that initiated the use of that as a tool on um, the Buena Vista wildlife area. And in that same year, I took it upon myself to also initiate a managed grazing project on the Paul J. Olson wildlife area. Um, our desire was to have that ability to adjust stocking, timing, and intensity to try to meet some of our management goals for the properties. So my pilot project was looking at um, the Paul Olson, it was a smaller property. And unlike Aaron's project, um, I ended up contracting all the infrastructure that was developed, which um, was a challenge, it ended up being fairly expensive. And the grazing specialist that I worked with wrote more of a forage based plan rather than a plan um, trying to consider more of the habitat goals that I had. Um, there was limited interest in my area at the time for rotational grazing as well. Uh, most folks were mostly interested in continuous grazing. And the producer and myself were new to the use of rotational grazing. So challenges came with that as well. So, you know, why grazing? Um, you know, we wanted that desire for flexibility, but specifically some of the things that we were looking at, um, you know, below ground, obviously looking at soil health, having clean water, um, maintaining and enhancing our grassland habitat, but then the objectives that I had primarily looking at the above ground were in trying to reduce the brush that we had on the grasslands, um, try to reduce some areas of residual grass, and then to control some herbaceous invasive species such as goldenrod, um, for example. In addition to that, um, I had the goal of trying to enhance plant species diversity as well, if that was a possibility. So support for public land grazing, it's, it's essential for your program as a manager. You need to have that support from your agency. And we did. 
So um, I see that Mary Anderson's um, in on this program here, uh, listening in. Um, at this time, we also, you know, our agency started promoting additional staff and other resources to support uh, grazing. Uh, one was to have a permanent grassland specialist, in addition to having a grazing team. And along with that, we also have um, developed a conservation grazing field guide, which provides guidance to all of our managers if they decide to use grazing as a habitat management tool. And in some respects, we've had some secured funding. Um, several years back, we had funding that came in that helped to provide infrastructure for some important um, pastures that we've established on some of our properties. And I was a recipient of that. That is very helpful as well. Um, another benefit to help support grazing is to make grassland a priority habitat. And our agency has done that. And because of that, then grazing is given much more latitude and um, having that as a, a tool to use for us in managing this high priority habitat. In addition, to that is uh, training, of course, which I'll touch on here. So some of the training that our agency has offered, um, initially when I first uh, started um, back so, uh, quite a while ago, we had what was called the Farming 101 program. It was a week-long course that was held for a new biologist or biologist that didn't have a lot of experience with agriculture, um, providing a really you know, wide uh, diversity of topics. Grazing was one of them. Uh, we've also had training or have been encouraged to take training in writing management plans and understanding nutrient management plans. Um, we've been encouraged to attend conferences such as the Grassworks, Grassworks Conference that's offered every year here in Wisconsin, uh, as well as just in the field training, which is very beneficial. Uh, sometimes it's informal. We'll have fencing days where we have local staff come together and work on installing the fence on a particular pasture and then in doing so, getting some experience with that. Um, we also get site visits from our grassland specialist, who then also helps to provide us with insight and guidance. Um, in addition to that, for me, the, the Greater Prairie Chicken Management Plan was something that has helped to support grazing within my area. So prairie chickens are a state-threatened species. They're found only in central Wisconsin for our state. And we revised the management plan for this species in 2022. With that was the desire in the plan to expand conservation grazing. And that provides a lot of support then for our local grazing program. Another essential component of a program that's successful and what I found to be very important is our partners and everything that they can do to help support us and for us to support them when it comes to grazing. Um, financial support is, is huge. Uh, we've had um, the ability to pool resources, so we've had greater success with our funding. Um, partners, for example, have donated recently half the cost of a skid steer uh, just last month for us. Um, they've helped to purchase land. Um, just two years ago, we had over 500 acres that were purchased in large part due to contributions from partners. And this property that was uh, purchased is now going to be grazed this coming spring. Um, many grants require partnerships to be eligible. So that also helps us. For example, right now, um, we applied for a conservation innovation grant, which is hopefully going to help support grazing if that is something that we're selected to receive within our area. Outreach is another important aspect of having our partnerships. Our partners spearhead a variety of important outreach efforts. Uh, we support those efforts and participate in many of them. Um, they include landowner mailings, uh, site visits, and workshops that are geared towards our landowners that are interested in grazing. Uh, we offer pasture walks, both on, you know, on public land, but then also support private land pasture walks, uh, social media as well. And some of the outcomes that are resulting by this is to have, you know, improved agricultural relations within our local community. Um, we're garnering a greater interest in public land grazing, as well as an appreciation for public lands. Um, another um, way in which we've worked with partners that have been really successful for me here locally, um, as of late, was the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Um, this is a program that's implemented by the USDA um, NRCS program, and I also partnered with the Pheasants Forever um, with our local farm bill biologist on this and, and enrolling two of our producers who graze on state land here last year. Uh, this program has um, requirements of five or more years on a grazing contract, but it's eligible for public lands. So I was able to uh, get cost share from the NRCS 
to install fencing infrastructure, cost share for solar pumps and installing wells as well, in addition to interseeding and on top of that, um, the producers that work with those that graze on state land then also receive annual grazing um, incentive payments. So you know, this program is in essence, um, basically helping to support grazing on public lands and support our public land producers, those that are coming out to help us do what we need to do to make management happen. Uh, some lessons that I've learned with this is to start early. Um, there's a lot of work involved with this program and having really good communication with your producer, your contractors, and the NRCS staff that you work with. Uh, another benefit that we've had here locally within our state is called the Adopt a Wildlife Area Program, and I consider these really great partners too. Um, this is a program that allows groups to adopt specific wildlife areas, and two of our properties that I have um, have been adopted by groups that then help us with our grazing program. Um, the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point student chapter of the Wildlife Society has adopted the Buena Vista property and they help with pasture infrastructure, installing the fencing as well as taking down fencing. They also help with maintenance of the fence and um, addressing brush control within pastures. Um, in addition, the Paul Olson Wildlife Area was adopted by the farmers of Milk Creek Watershed Council. And this is a great opportunity for us to be able to develop a, a better relationship with our local agricultural community and also for the farmers within that area to develop a, um, a respect and an appreciation for public lands as well. So really great programs and they're helping to get our grazing programs well underway. Uh, finding producers is obviously very important to, has, to have a successful program. Um, in the past, we really didn't have a lot of outreach. We worked with just local mailings to producers that we already knew about. Um, we have since expanded that outreach and with greater outreach efforts, we're seeing more diverse producers from different backgrounds, um, pasture walks, workshops and conferences. We have partners send out um, through their mailing list when we have availability for pastures on uh, public lands and a new uh, web page as well. Um, our new web page, I received a call from a producer in Florida this year um, who had plans to move to Wisconsin and was searching online for grazing opportunities. So this is somebody that never would have even known about this had it not been for the web page. Developing relationships with producers is also real key. So past social research in central Wisconsin has basically revealed the lack of trust in our state agencies locally by the agricultural community. And developing that trust takes time and effort. Successful grazing partnerships require that we have a manager and a producer that understand one another's grazing goals and each other's limitations. Uh, as a manager, I um, fully try to share my decision-making and, and to share that decision-making with the producer. And I try to make clear my objectives and goals for the property. Um, I also need to make sure that I'm available that um, on evenings and weekends that I am able to answer questions if need be, because sometimes that's when producers are, are more available. Um, communication styles are also important and you need to be flexible. Some farmers wish that I come into person and sit at their kitchen table to talk about grazing. Um, others um, would prefer that they just send texts back and forth with me. So um, ad adaptation is key. Uh, some other uh, things that I have to address with grazing, which sometimes can be a challenge, are rare species protocols. Uh, we have a number of rare species, butterflies, birds, uh, on our properties, and we need to do what we can to prevent take when we are in these properties, and that includes when we're grazing. So and some of the requirements that we have are avoidance periods. So considering stocking rates, for example, um, if we're grazing during the nesting season or only grazing so many acres or even considering, um, you know, what time of the year we're grazing, maybe looking at grazing off season outside of the nesting season. So just certain things that we have to consider when, when we're implementing our, our pastures. Now, the management plans that, that we have, we, we consult with our grassland specialist. Um, who is certified plan writer um, for meeting USDA NRCS 528 grazing plans. Um, but a lot of times, as is the case with me, I write the management plan and then I consult back and forth with our specialist who then signs off on it. Uh, the plans um, develop our habitat and species goals and objectives. Um, we get inventories of what we currently have for forage and other rare resources such as our endangered species. 
And also just, um, it lays out the plans. So our livestock grazing regime, how we plan and monitor, um, how we're gonna address contingency plans and just general operations and maintenance, such as who is going to be responsible for what component of the grazing management plan, the producer or the manager. Now the grazing regimes that I have overall, um, for me, the habitat objectives are what are driving the grazing regime. So my average residual grass heights on the properties tend to range anywhere from six to 10 inches. And I do this for a number of reasons. You know, I'm looking overall at providing wildlife cover while also grazing. And so I want to make sure that I'm having that consideration. I have at least some amount of cover um, post moving cattle out of paddocks. I'm looking at sometimes also having that combination of late stocking rates and faster moves to try to minimize damage to nesting birds. Um, as we know now that nest damage is based on the number of animals and the number of days. So that's a consideration that I'm making. Um, having that residual grass heights are also, something, are also something that I use to help consider when to kick in contingency plans, as well as when to start or to stop grazing during the season. Um, typically early on, I tend to have producers move their stock more often. Um, and this also helps to have higher quality forage and try to help minimize the damage to nests during the nesting season. Later on, we tend to slow it down to maybe two or three days um, for movements. Um, we have primarily cool season grasslands on the properties that I manage and we get into that cool season slump later in the summer. Um, I try to have longer rotations when possible. Uh, we don't know that birds typically, it takes them four to five weeks to fledge nestlings. And most of the rotations I have are closer to, to three to four weeks, but sometimes when it's possible, we try to get anywhere between four and five weeks. Um, uh, also trying to address that, we do establish refuge areas within some of our pastures. So several of my larger rotational pastures um, have refuges that are established within the center of the pasture or in areas that are away from trees and buildings to, to provide those opportunities for nesting birds. As I'd mentioned, monitoring is really important within our program. Um, you know, are we meeting our objectives? Well, the only way to do that is to monitor. Um, I do weekly monitoring during the season. And, um, you know, it's not any by any means a research project. I'm simply going out and I'm checking, you know, what are the average residual grass heights? Where are the, the cattle right now? Have they moved from the last time that I checked? Um, where are we at with stocking? Um, I use that, as I mentioned, to address our contingency plans. Um, this past season was the first time since 2012 that we've had to address that. And there were some challenges too with that, but because we were monitoring, we were able to um, respond when, when necessary to address that by either reducing or removing livestock, or in some cases having sacrifice areas. Uh, fencing overall is something that we do ourselves. Um, we found that it's less expensive. It requires staff and time. Um, sometimes we do contract work when we do have the funding and we just do not have the time. Um, we're always adapting our process, um, updating our equipment, refining how we do things as we learn. Um, some of the lessons that I've learned is to plan ahead, do your upfront work, get your cost estimates, request the funds and the staffing that you're going to need ahead of time. Prior to installing, you know, you want to mow your fence lines. Maybe you want to consider bringing in backup, which we do often. We have staff from other areas come in and help us do our work, and we call it a training opportunity. Um, we also encourage training for the staff that we have dedicated in our area that are um, constantly uh, working with our fencing so that they have the training and experience as well. Um, with electric, we provide our producers with energizers and solar panel kits, batteries and um, fence testers. Uh, challenges that I have found with electric systems on public lands are the off the clock damage. Um, I found that a lot of malfunctions tend to occur on weekends um, and in evenings when perhaps I'm away at conferences or I'm not working. And so I need to think about this. Who will cover for me when I'm out of town? Um, another challenge is vandalism and theft. Um, since we're not living on the properties that are having the grazing done on public lands, we have to think about that. And it does occur from time to time. Um, uh, the first few weeks I put out a solar pump here this last year, we had one of the panels uh, damaged. So there's always considerations to keep equipment well hidden, not next to the road, um, make sure that we have an inventory in case we ever have to address insurance um, for loss or theft. 
Uh, and something else you don't really think about very often with public lands, but when you grazing, but when it comes to it, then you certainly do is um, that call when someone tells you that your cows are on the road and they're not your cows. Um, livestock escape onto public land pastures or I mean off of them quite often. Um, sometimes it just happens due to um, having too much vegetation putting on the fence at certain times or livestock perhaps not res respecting the fence, um, or, or at times we've even had gates opened um, on public lands and we're not aware of that until cattle were out. So you now this does happen, it happens on weekends, evenings at all times, and you need to be responsive to that. Uh, lessons I've learned obviously is check the fences regularly, uh, lock the gates. Um, I create pasture maps with the contacts for all the producers and I provide those to our dispatch in the county as well as our wardens. And I share that, that map then to neighbors as well, so that if cows are out, they know who to call. Uh, with our water systems, uh, we have a lot of different varieties of systems. We have ponds that we have dug, um, gravity-fed pumping from those ponds. Uh, we install wells in certain locations with electric or solar pumps. And uh, we utilize them portable water tanks with above and below water, water line. Um, it really, when we use the above and grow, below ground, it really depends um, on the characteristics of the property and the funding that we have available. Um, but typically our, our water line tends to be above ground. Um, some of the challenges that I've had with creating water sources for pastures on public lands, um, well drilling, it, it can be very expensive in some areas that depends on the depth and other factors. Um, in my area, it's ranged anywhere from nine to $15,000 on estimates for wells. Um, permitting can also be a challenge. Um, on the Palos and Wildlife area, we have largely clay and muck soils. And so I sometimes have to get wetland permits when we're digging uh, ponds um, as far as where I'm going to place the fill to ensure that that is not being placed in a wetland. Um, uh, transport can also be a challenge. Uh, we live in a, this is a very flat landscape overall, and trying to transport water over long distances obviously can be a challenge that we have to address from time to time. Um, for water installation and maintenance, um, we do most of it ourselves. Um, we found that it's cheaper, but it does require a lot of staff time, equipment, and planning. Um, sometimes we have contractors um, to save time, but it does cost a lot more than. Uh, for water line, as I mentioned, we use mostly above ground. Um, we've done below ground for larger long-term pastures. Um, some lessons that I've got is just plan, plan, um, simply the same with most other things. Don't expect to easily lay water line in November when it's 25 degrees and overcast. Um, you know, when flushing lines, make sure you play, you pay close attention to um, if it's a late season grazing, um, that you are not doing it when it's getting too cold and you miss your, your time frame there and have water freezing within your lines. Um, you want to plan ahead to either do that yourself to flush the lines or get a contractor in in time. Um, so for equipment and storage uh, and inventory that we have, I've learned um, over time that as we develop more and more pastures, um, we have right now between 10 and 15 pastures that I oversee each year, we develop um, the need for having a lot of equipment and then where do we put it? So we need to keep track of it. Um, if you look at before, that's what we used to have. We'd have equipment laying all over the place. It was a mess, things weren't labeled. Um, trying to get ready in the spring was sometimes a disaster. Um, so we've since learned that we need to label all of our equipment, assign them to specific pastures, make sure that we've got dedicated storage space on where we're gonna put our equipment. And then that is all labeled as well. Um, in early winter, right now, we organize all that equipment. We pull aside any male functioning equipment and make sure that we send it in to be repaired. It makes it a lot easier come spring when we're all balancing our time trying to do prescribed burning and surveys in, in addition to also getting ready for our pastures. Um, now, I've also had some organic producers that I've worked with on the Palos and Wildlife area, and there's considerations to think about that when you have public land grazing with organic producers. So um, one thing you need to be familiar with is the National Organic Program Pasture Rule. Um, and that requires that you have more than 120 days of pasture grazing and greater than 30% dry matter intake from the pasture. You need to think about fencing, having setbacks from neighbors to reduced drift from pesticide and using untreated prost, for example. Um, with pesticide use, you have to be long-term thinking about it. 
three years prior to bringing in that producer, you have to stop using chemicals. So that's something to think about when you're trying to deal with invasive brush and other species. Um, forage too, um, you need to think about if you're going to do interseeding, where you're gonna get your organic seed sources. So some of the things to think about there when you have uh, organic producers. Um, now getting back down to just achieving our wildlife objectives at the start of the presentation, I had mentioned what my primary objectives were. And I'd like to just take a, ch um, a chance here to address some of the challenges and successes I've had with meeting some of those objectives. So managed grazing has been very beneficial that I found overall in just providing structural and species diversity for plants. Different regimes in our pastures result in this diversity, um, and it provides habitat for the seasonal life stages of many species. For instance, prairie chickens or upland sandpipers want tall, dense vegetation for successful nesting, but they also need areas of recently grazed are um, areas or areas that are hayed, for example, for their um, brood rearing habitat. Uh, woody vegetation control. Um, this is something that we've been able to do, um, get some results from some research as a result of UW-Madison and the Pasture Project. Um, local research study and our own observations have suggested that we can control some brush with grazing. Um, for example, total aspen on some of our properties, um, the cover of aspen has been reduced from browsing. Cattle are drawn to shade too and they'll rub up against the trees. We also know that stocking density is very important um, and likely there's the greatest impacts where we have the highest stocking densities on brush. Um, overall, it tends to be that we found so far with the research to be more effective to combine grazing with herbicide. Um, another consideration is when you're um, removing brush is to um, address the opportunity there to either cut brush very low or have it very high so you can reduce that chance to um, having hoof injury to livestock. Um, we do some herbaceous invasive control too, and we've looked at that um, overall. Um, goldenrod, you know, has a, it's been shown to have high nutritive value when eaten earlier in the season. Um, so it's best to target areas with goldenrod earlier on. Um, prior to their flowering, we found that um, we, have, we have some um, species of thistle as well, and um, trying to have a combination of grazing and herbicide can help to control some thistle species as well. Um, so we do plan to target areas of thistle with higher stocking rates and shorter duration um, in the future to try to address some of that. Uh, we've done some interseeding as well in some of the pastures on the Paulson wildlife area, and I've had some success with interseeding clover. That's also been done on the Buena Vista wildlife area. Um, I have producers that do light disking in the fall and then they frost seed in the winter as an in-kind service. And we've had some limited success um, trying to establish native flowers as well. Um, I use hardy species that are more competitive with cool season grasses and it requires some exclusion of livestock um, following the establishment. So sometimes if we're doing that, I'll make those areas of seeding uh, the refuge areas. So um, something in the future we might also consider is the use of prescribed fire um, to help reduce that litter layer in the fall and then help to establish areas where we wanna target interseeding of forbs. So I just, uh, I wanna wrap this up by just you know, reinforcing the fact that as public land managers, many of the management actions that we utilize can be accomplished in a vacuum if we allow them to. When we're spraying invasives or we're cutting trees with a chainsaw, you know, we can really lose touch with the landowners and the agricultural community that surround the lands that we manage. Grazing can be an effective way to bring everyone together. It's not just a habitat management tool. Um, it brings people and the partnerships that are connected to our public lands back into focus. It can help promote engagement and conservation efforts on both public and private lands. Um, it can serve as an example for what we as land managers want to see implemented on private lands as well. But lastly, grazing helps to foster, you know, foster these partnerships that we've developed and helps us to bring public land managers, those conservation agencies, and our agricultural community together. Well, thank you. Um, hopefully we still got some time for some questions. Yeah, wonderful, Lisa. <laughs> thank you so much for that presentation. That was so useful and just amazing that all the work that y'all are doing on the, on these properties with grazing. And that's just so many acres to, to manage. It's super impressive. Um, if mm -hmm. anybody has questions, um, feel free to put them in the, in the chat box and, um, 
Lisa, I'm going to have you stop sharing your screen on the yeah. screen that you are sharing. Do you see that little red? I'm going to try to find it again. I know it's tricky. Oh boy. <laughs> Should say stop oh. sharing. Let's see. There we go. Got oh, it. Wonderful. Great. <laughs> um, I know it's a tricky, a, a new platform for every day. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so as I was saying, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, this is also a smaller group, so also feel free to unmute um, if you'd like to ask your question out loud. So we do have a one question in the chat. Do you, Lisa, have areas that you graze heavily to allow early successional species weedy to establish? Does that question make sense? Um, Justin, feel free to come off mute if you want to ask the question live. Well, we, we have utilized on the, some of the pastures that I've been working on, adjusting where our poly wire is to focus in areas to reduce brush temporarily. So we've had areas where we've cut or mowed brush and I want to focus livestock in a little bit longer within a particular area. I've used step in post with producers to try to focus in does that help answer that question? But it's your your question, Justin. Um, yeah, just curious. We um did some guys you to um basically do some weedy. Um, well, I'm having problems um, hearing Justin. Oh, yeah, speak up a little bit, Justin. Um, it's okay. Let me change. Mm. Yeah, I think he's just switching audio. Is that better? There we go. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <I could. laughs> um, uh, there's some work done at ISU to look at um, pretty heavy, basically mob grazing to um, take a lot of the forage material down and do a little bit of soil disturbance in the process to bring back some of the early successional kind of weedy species to add a little bit of habitat diversity. I didn't know if that was anything that you had considered doing or done in the past? Yeah, my colleague, Erin Grossman, has done that. Uh, I know she's done that on the Leola wildlife area, um, having much higher stocking densities to address uh, ragweed, I believe. Um, mine, uh, so far, I have not done it as a whole uh, within a particular pasture, but I focus in on areas to artificially increase the stocking rate within particular target areas of the pasture where I have issues with, with brush or other, or I'm um, trying to focus in um, earlier on in the season where I've got higher densities of goldenrod, for example. But I've not done mob grazing um, at a much larger scale. Um, yeah, yep, well, that yep. answers the question. Yeah, but it'd be more a very particular area that, that you wanna do that in, not the whole thing. It takes yes. a lot of work. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, and and Erin did talk about this a little bit last week that she kind of did that mob grazing kind of she was like it was a risk but it worked in her favor for that really like all that I think it was ragweed that she was having I think it really helped. Um, okay, so another question in the chat: Are you working with Can Canadia thistle rust to control that thistle? We have it on our farm and it significantly reduces the cover of that plant. Also, the livestock spread it for us. <laughs> Can they, did, okay, what I think we have Canada thistle, thistle on our Canada. properties, mm -hmm. and we are trying to address thistle with grazing and, and other tools as well. We use in combination herbicide. Um, did what else did he say? Sherry, do you want to come off mute and answer your question or ask your question? I'm sorry. Oh, Sherry, I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. Um, hey, Sherry. <laughs> hey, Lisa. Um, yeah, we have this uh, rust fungus um, that's just basically endemic wherever Canada thistle exists, and it's an organic way of managing the thistle, but um, it wasn't ever anything that I was taught in my formal education or even um, informally, um, but I found it in our pastures and um, dug into what it was and uh, found out what it is. And now Michael Fields Institute is um, has some grant to import some strain of it from Colorado. And I'm thinking, why? Um, we have it here in Wisconsin already. We might as well be 
harvesting it and using it. And I just put a, a link to a publication on that topic in, in the chat. But um, I'm surprised that it hasn't been investigated or used more um, besides, uh, I mean, I know we have other biological is uh, control issues that have um, not worked out as well, but this one is already here. It's not like something we need to introduce or go find strains from some other state. Yeah, that is new to me too. Um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'm going to have to check out the link on that. Um, no, I, I was not aware. That's very interesting. Thanks for yeah. sharing. Thanks for sharing <laughs> that, that article too. Um, yeah, you never know. Which I like it whenever we get to learn a little bit from the attendees of webinars too. So that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to come off mute or put them in the chat box. Lisa, are you planning on doing anything with goats for brush control? Oh, you know, I would be very welcome and open to that. Um, I'm not currently aware of producers in our area, but if you know of any, um, I'm, I'm open to utilizing that. We did try a test pilot with goats um, uh, many years ago, Aaron did on the Buena Vista Wildlife Area, um, but it was short-lived. Um, but yeah, I, I'm definitely interested. I, I think that would be an opportunity on that property. Um, probably not so much on the Paulson where we're dealing with a lot of heavier clay soils and standing water, um, I suspect. But um, yeah, I, I'm open to it. You could you could apply the goats during the winter in those areas where there's standing water and they can control your red odor dogwood and various other um, willows and woody in invasives that tend to invade the wetlands. Um, and electrified netting works really well. If you go to hiregoats.com, there's a um, whole list of producers that do brush control with their goats as a contracting service. And I've been mentoring a bunch of them over the years. so. Um, there might be some in your area. I'm not. I'm not familiar with exactly what areas all the different um, go browsing contractors cover, but they would they would uh, be interested in working with you. And and folks like Jesse Bennett have been working with Minnesota DNR um, and uh, Pheasants Forever and other land conservation organizations um, since 2008, which is when I first got into goats to um, doing this as a service. So they're they're basically professionals that um, that use their goats for brush management uh, objectives and, and conservation objectives. Okay. They're very popular. I live in Virginia. They're very popular here because of the mountains and goats will run up those hills and take out the invasives. Uh, thanks for sharing that with us. I have a, a question for you, Lisa, um, yeah. about funding. Actually, that you have from, I've talked to lots of land managers and folks that work for different agencies kind of across the upper Midwest region. And you have been very successful, it seems, with finding outside funding. And I didn't know that EQIP, that public land was eligible. I've heard folks say yeah. that they encourage their producers that graze on public land to try and get EQIP dollars for themselves. So you have is this the first time you've done that? Have you yeah, done that a lot? Yeah, okay. 2023 was the first time. And you know, there really wasn't uh, much for me to look at as, as far as, uh, I think there maybe might've been one or two other managers that have tried it in the state. And, um, it, you know, it, it, there were certain some, like some challenges to work through it. It took some time. Um, we're still uh, completing those projects, but yeah, the benefits from it are just uh, amazing. I didn't, I didn't know at the time that there was a grazing practice payment. Um, so, you know, each year that they are in this this program, they're getting a payment for grazing for every acre that they're grazing public land. And we wow. ended up getting, I mean, the cost share, they say cost share, mm -hmm. in, in many respects, it covered all the costs that we had for our infrastructure. Wow. And we were able to get in water lines, solar pumps, and, and we're putting in wells as well. And so it, it's been great on both ends. Um, the word is spreading. Yeah. I have producers calling me now asking if they can put equip on the pastures that they have uh, okay. already on public land so well that's very encouraging it's a huge huge barrier finding funding for work for grazing on public land is such a barrier so that's really encouraging thank you for yes. sharing that um and i'm going to ask there's one more question in the the chat i want to ask real quick before we end today um have you experimented with virtual fencing at all on your properties no i haven't and i i've definitely seen 
the information, been to the grassroots conferences where they've been talking about it. Um, I, I'm I'm taking more of a wait and see approach. Um, I'd like to see if there's other public land managers out there that are having success with that. Um, just um, trying to, to work through some of the challenges I think that we would have never knowing who our producer is going to be. On some of our pastures, we have a new producer every single year. Um, and then others, yeah, it's five or six years. Um, mm -hmm. But just the, some of the challenges, challenges with trying to get livestock we don't own with mm -hmm. collars and how you work that out. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I do know in Iowa, they are working on um, a, a demonstration experiment. So keep okay. a, an ear out for those folks, probably be another year or so. Yeah. Um, but I do work at, uh, at Sherburn National Wildlife Refuge with virtual fencing too, um, in combination with uh, the Sustainable Farming Association. Oh, okay. So that's in Minnesota. Yep, that's in Minnesota. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, yes, and I see Mary C said two to three year wait to get callers. Yeah, it's a new and emerging thing. So that's very exciting. Um, well, we are a minute over for this webinar, so I'm going to wrap us up um, for today. And I want to thank everybody for coming, especially Lisa, for offering your perspective. We really appreciate it. I hope everybody got something out of today's webinar. We have yeah. another webinar in this series next week, and you can register for that at the link I just put in. It's with two folks from Missouri Department of Conservation, and they're sharing their research on grazing and how it affects specifically the northern bobwhite quail species, some research that they did in Missouri, which is very interesting. So um, hot take is that it's beneficial. Grazing is beneficial to bobwhite. So come and see those results. My contact information, Lisa's, is also in the chat. And everybody have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.